Hey there viewers and welcome back to the South Main Auto Channel. So we're sitting inside a 2008 Jeep Commander. It's got the big 5.7 Hemi in it. And the guy left me a note. And he writes, When driving from State College to Buffalo, cars started to vibrate between 1800 and 2500 RPMs and has a rough idle. Call me. That's all I know. So now that we're all up to speed and you know what I know, that is where we we're at. And I completely agree with him. I started it up to drive it in. Uh, so the engine's still cold. The money light is on. It's not flashing, but it does appear or sound to have a single cylinder misfire. From what? I don't know. Uh, I did just plug in the Alltel and pulled codes, and they just popped up. And I've got this P1417 and the classic catalyst code. I'm assuming his engine light's been on a while. Uh, with a catalyst code, perhaps. I will have to call him and find out. But the P1470 says... Uh, what's that say? Cylinder 7 reaction, something rather, reaction control performance. So that's pretty interesting. I have never ran across that code, and I can't even venture a guess what the uh, code setting criteria is, but we will have to look that up. Um, I'm assuming it's cylinder 7 that's misfiring. I would think. I don't know why it doesn't have a PO307 in it, but... Um, so we can probably take this a couple ways. We can uh, look up the code setting criteria for the 1417, see what that states. Uh, I believe this engine is one of the, uh, I don't know if it's multi-displacement cylinder, what Chrysler calls it, where, you know, it can shut down four cylinders, essentially, uh, under, you know, low load conditions for efficiency. Uh, I don't know if cylinder number seven is on that, you know, circuit, perhaps. Uh, this is stuff we're going to have to learn, so you guys will learn along with me. I'll start it up, let you hear it. Oh, great, she doesn't even run now. You probably can't hear it because I got the pipe on it, but it is, you know, bump, 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 bump. especially when you put it in gear. Uh, yeah, you can definitely tell it has a miss. Uh, I don't believe in these old Chryslers that you can pull up, at least with the Alltel, any kind of misfire data here. I'll poke around and see. I do not believe that you can, though. So I didn't see it in any of the uh, live data. Uh, but I do see it here in mode 6, um, so this is going to be our cylinder 7 misfire data. It does have some counts already stacked up there. So we'll assume it's number 7, but let's go look up the code setting criteria here first. So I pulled up our code criteria. Um, basically it says here, I guess you guys could read it, but I'll read it to you. Uh, when our criteria has been met, power supplied to each MDS, so multi-displacement system, I don't know what we'll call that. Uh, solenoid, when the engine is making transition from 8-cylinder eight, eight mode to 4-cylinder mode by actuating the solenoids, oil pressure is raised to pair to the pair of lifters that coincide with each particular solenoid. The oil pressure pushes the lock pin and allows the lifter to collapse, decoupling the valve and camshaft. It's monitored during the 4- to 8-cylinder mode transition, and the code will set when it fails to disengage for cylinder number 7. So that is pretty interesting. Um... I'm trying to determine if that, you know, is, I mean, I assume it's a circuit code, but it also monitors the actual deactivation of that cylinder. Uh, is that causing our misfire, or is this a code that's been stored in there? Um, that I do not know. Uh, that would take a little, we'd have to be talking to the customer to figure that out. Of course, it gives us a circuit test that wants us to do. It's a simple solenoid circuit, so uh, clearly check it for resistance and control. Um, and then I suppose we could have a, you know, a physically damaged uh, lifter, which I have seen before on these, the little springs that go inside of them for the lock pins, they break and then the lifter fails. And I don't ever remember seeing this code though, so that's, that's pretty interesting. I'm curious if we pop back in here, if there is an activation test where we can, let's say, turn them circuits on and off. I do not know, but we'll find out. I do not see it there. Probably has to be warmed up anyways. Uh, injector kill, throttle, NVLD. I do not see it there. It's probably a key on engine off test only. Speed control, it's all EVAP, NVLD stuff. Cylinder deactivation. I don't know if they actually make a physical noise. So we'll go like this. We'll just toggle it. Of course my phone's ringing again. Come on F2, shut off baby. 
Oh, okay, wait a minute here. Okay, it's prepared it. I wait for my stupid phone. Okay, it's done ringing now. It must be it turns on the auto shutdown relay. That's what I hear humming under the hood, so let's just toggle it. And I do hear something out there clicking. Alright. Let's just back out of this. We'll go to cylinder 7. I'll just see if I hear the same clicking. We don't need any data. Okay, I do hear some clicking out there. Whether it has a relay that controls it, I'm not 100% sure. I'm pretty sure it's ECM controlled. I doubt it goes through any other kind of relay. So that's something worth noting. I am curious. We know the codes. We know we've got a 430 and 417. I've already got those saved. So I want to take and just, this is not typically my habit. Um, before we do that, let's just look at some freeze frame data. Don't want to be that guy. I know this may seem a little monotonous. Um, however, I try to do what we can from the driver's seat, gather some data. PCM mileage since mill on. It's been 622 miles. It's got 182. Okay. Let's see if he was all the way. Yeah, perhaps. All right, so that's some good information to have. Four hundred forty-two. Okay, so this does seem relevant. Okay, fantastic. So now that we know this, I am going to take and clear the codes because I want to know if if the misfire, you know, once it generates this code, does it deactivate that cylinder, like shut it down completely as a default strategy? Because I don't want to go chasing a misfire that, you know, doesn't exist or is part of a default strategy. Sometimes you can't get that info in out of service info. So let's just see if it's still. Okay. still running rough okay all right perfect so I just did two key cycles with it uh, and then we immediately came back with a 1417 active code so let's chase it I know this really doesn't pertain to the fix but this is something to keep in mind so we can see uh, you know by clearing the code we have not met what would be considered their you know set criteria so according to this it's only monitored when transition from four to eight cylinder mode but clearly we haven't done that we've simply shut the car off and started it two times um, and then through the code so you know kind of take some of the stuff you read in service data with a grain of salt if you will so we've got a wiring diagram for these um, multi-displacement system there we go did I say that already I think we got it right even uh, so it looks like it affects cylinders 1, 4, 6, and 7 are the four cylinders that it, you know, shuts down. Uh, they all share the same ground. Uh, they do go to a splice. And then it appears that the control side must be power side switched. In the service data, we do have a resistance spec for the solenoids. Uh, so we can start there, uh, make sure it's receiving its command, which we did hear a little clicking going on under the hood. So uh, we'll assume it is. And then... I think it would probably be in our best interest to also make sure that number seven is a cylinder that actually has the misfire. You know, this could be a code, even though freeze frame data made it look like it was something very recent. Uh, it'd be silly to diagnose this and find out that, you know, we got a bad coil pack somewhere else. So before we get too deep here, I'm just going to go quick and dirty. I want to make sure that cylinder number seven, so it's going to be the back on the driver's side, it's 1357 and 2468, just like the old shivvies. Uh, we'll take and unplug that coil just to make sure that's a cylinder misfiring. Uh, make me feel a little better anyways. Yeah, it definitely is. I'll grab a different cylinder here. Yeah. 
So yeah, it's definitely number seven is not contributing. So one more thing I want to do before we get rolling too far. I grabbed our amp clamp and the, our uh, uh, meter here. I just want to throw it around uh, the injector and the ignition coil. I just want to make sure that cylinder has everything else it needs to fire. Then we're going to go uh, a little deeper into this MDS system. Uh, you may think this is kind of silly or irrelevant and it may be a default strategy for the ECM to actually shut down this cylinder. Uh, we know that's one cause in a misfire. Uh, my belly's telling me, or we know cylinder seven's causing a misfire to say, but my gut's telling me the injectors in these are super common to fail. Does it have anything to do with our MDS code? Not at all, don't get me wrong. It has zero to do with it. But I'm just curious if, uh, <laughs> you know, if a misfire can generate those codes uh, being that we know our code setting criteria is not correct, it'll just sit better with me when I know, okay, you know, yes, our coil's working, yes, our injector's working, okay, now we'll move forward. Like I say, it may sound ridiculous, but that's what I'd like to do. Now, it could be a default strategy for the ECM to actually shut down that injector, so bear in mind that, uh, but let's just check it for what it's worth and see where it's at. Started up now. We already well, we unplugged the coil. I, I shouldn't say we already know that works, but we assume that works. So I'm going to set this up on 20 amps here. Let's get the, we'll get the screen moved down, and we will set up the trigger. I'll get this where you guys can see it a little better here in a minute. Um, probably 50 milliseconds. I'm going to need a wire on the coil. I'm going the right way, okay. So here's our ignition coil. Um, let's get some more time on the screen here. Gonna have to move our trigger here a little bit, bear with me. So there's our ignition coil. That appears to be working well, pulling pretty high amperage. Darn near 12 amps it looks like. So now I'm gonna change this back to a lower amp scale, we'll go let's say two amps. I'll move our trigger way down here. Injectors usually aren't much more than an amp. Um, I'll take and grab one of these injector wires. Like I said, the ECM may have this shut down. All right, either I got something set up wrong or it is not firing. Let me just check the companion injector here. Okay. So here, oops, can't lay it on the ignition coil dummy. So there is cylinder number five injector current ramp and it is going up to about a little over an amp, like 1.2 amps. So then I go back here, I'll make sure I got the control wire. So I have, and we got, we got nothing. So, is that a default strategy of the ECM or <laughs> do we just have a bad injector and something going on with this MDS business? Leave the key back on, I do not know. I think perhaps the easiest way to tell, uh, just so we're certain, we'll take our scan tool, we'll go under active test, we should be able to trigger that injector. Should be able to see it or better yet, maybe I'll get us a, uh, uh, get us a noid light in there. Uh, that way we got some kind of something visual. Make sure that sucker works. Okay. Got this annoyed light. We will put it in there. What we'll do is just to show you guys what we're doing. We will go. Gotta pick two because it's got stupid red locks. Oh, it's gonna go right in my finger. Nope. So we'll go cylinder number five. We know that one works. So we'll stick our annoyed light in here. That just plugs in in place of the injector. All right, so there's that. And then I've got it pulled up on our scan tool. Do we want data stream? We do not. All right, so this should be toggling. Oh yeah, there, I just seen it flash. I don't know if you guys can see that. It's really quick and really dim. Let me zoom you in. So that is the number five. That's just the ECM just briefly toggling that injector periodically. Okay, so that's that's what it looks like or what it should look like. So we'll plug that back in. I just oh, I just heard it fire the injector. 
So we'll back back out. We will go on number seven. Now this should bypass any any default strategies in the ECM. So if I see this flicker, I may be completely wasting my time here, but I would just like to know for sure our coil appears to work. At least the primary side of it does. All right, let's go to number seven. We do not want data stream. We will toggle this. We can see that one flickers. So that means we have control. Uh, just for whatever reason, uh, you know, because of that cylinder deactivation, the ECM is shutting off that circuit. However, it appears to have control over it. So that is definitely a default strategy. So a lot of you may, you know, already say like, well, that's a waste of time. You know, we have this code for this, you know, MDS control solenoid, you know, possibly an engine mechanical, you know, fault, whether broken lifter or shorted solenoid, something like that. You know, why did I check? check that well like I say injectors are super failure prone on these they don't always set codes for them I just wanted to be hundred percent sure you know does the ECM have control of everything on that cylinder it appears it does now I'll move on the other aspect of it too is we can use it for a good learning lesson because let's say you know let's say you brought this car in the bay or you know one of your guys in your shop brought it in the bay yeah the engine lights on yeah it's probably got a misfire code didn't take the time to read the codes out of it comes over here you know, checks it out, oh, this injector's not firing, gets on this big rabbit trail, uh, you know, tracing wires, slapping a computer and it, changing injectors, uh, you know, come to find out that, you know, it's a default strategy by the ECM. The ECM says, nope, MDS is not working on that cylinder. It nixes the injector to try to preserve the cat and, well, the rest is history. Uh, so, I guess let it be a lesson to you. So next, this black on black. We're gonna start. Uh, oh man, freaking red locks. We're gonna check the resistance on these four solenoids. It's black on orange. Let me just see. Freaking things. They put them in three different connectors: black and orange, black and natural. I'm just kind of curious. We should be able to. Uh, Ohm, ohm check these out, do a resistance check on them. I'm just kind of curious how all of them sit in comparison to what the chart says it should be. So we're going to check right here, right from the source, right from the ECM to ground now, uh, according to data. Uh, at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, they're 11 ohms. So it'll be anywhere from uh, at zero degrees, 8.8 .8 ohms, up to 300 degrees, 15 ohms. So we should find them somewhere in that neighborhood. So I'm going to get back to our wiring diagram here. Uh, let me grab us an appropriate front probe and our meter. Right, so hopefully you guys can see that. I'm going to hook. Uh, where's the ground on these? Ground's ground, right? G101. So it's got to be somewhere up here. Imagine a Chrysler with a bad ground. You guys have probably never heard of that, have you? So we'll just grab a ground here on this old screw. And this old screw sounds like an episode on TLC or something. Well, maybe we will. Hopefully I can get this set up where we can all see it. We will just go to digital meter. We'll go to ohmage. We will use our last calibrated value. I will check it on a different ground here. 0.9. Four from the court. Let me just make sure I've got a good connection. Bear with me, folks. You gotta verify your test equipment, I guess. So that's negative battery to engine block 0. 0.000. Okay, so we are gonna go. We will check cylinder number one first. That is connector C3, pin number six. So that is C3. Black with natural, pin number six. Whoa. That's 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. That one is 12.06 ohms. And then we will test, oops, get my diagram again. Number four is in connector C1, pin number 28. C1 is black on black, number 28. 
should be right here. Make sure I'm getting a good touch on that one. That one is 12.5 ohms, we'll call it. All right. Go back to my diagram. We will do number six, which is in connector C2. <laughs> so they put them all over the place. Pin number 16. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Should be that one. 11.95 ohms. I just like to see how they kind of stack up. I know we're shooting for number seven, but may as well. Uh, connector C3, pin number five. C3, pin number five. Black with natural, number one's top right. One, two, three, four, number five. 12.89. So that tells us that physically, our solenoid circuit is intact and within spec, let's just see here, 12.9 ohms should be approximately 150 degrees. All right, well, we're definitely within that spec. Of course, the engine has not been running that long. Uh, da, da. So we'll plug these back in. So I think what we'll do next, I've got my amp clamp down here uh, because we know that our resistance is good. I want to make sure that the control from the ECM is good. Um, the connector to get to this thing, to, you know, to make sure, you know, to check it for power, it's buried. It's on the back side of this intake. I looked it up. It's connector C112, something like that. It does not look pleasant to get to. So the next easiest thing, uh, we know the resistance is around, you know, 12 ohms-ish. So... Uh, Ohm's law is going to tell us that it's going to pull around one amp. It's going to be very similar to an injector. So we're going to use a scan tool. We're going to toggle it on. We've got an amp clamp around the control for number seven. And we'll see what we see. I've got the scan tool hooked up. We do not need any data, so we will toggle it. And then let's change, change our time here. And there we go. So we can see every time it toggles that solenoid on. Now these look like square waves, so I would be concerned. I mean, if that solenoid is shorted, then you know, you're gonna see a square wave like that. Now you're gonna have to bear with me as I try to use Snap-on scope here. Their scopes are opposite everybody else. We gotta zoom way in, or zoom way out to get an enhanced look at it. Okay, so we'll pause it. Let me take and turn the test off. We should really be using our Pico for this, but. I always gotta retrain myself on Snap-on stuff. I like to do things backwards. So let's see if we can find the beginning of this waveform. There we go, how can we... Ah, dang it. Manual scroll, auto scroll slow, can we do that? Auto scroll slow is unavailable. I'd like to find the beginning of it a little bit better here. Oops. I don't think we're gonna dang it all the heck. Oh, there we go. Use the up arrow, you dummy. Nope. <laughs> oh, that doesn't work either. Let's just try something here. Anywho, let's just enhance the other way. Just gonna make me mad. Oh, there we go. So there is the beginning of a waveform. This is what I would expect to see. There is actual pinnel movement in it. So as the amperage starts to build, it overcomes, you know, the mechanical force moves, the amperage drops, and then it, you know, peaks out again. This is what I would expect to see on a functioning solenoid. Uh, I guess what we could do, if we wanted to be 100% definitive, we could look at, you know, a known good one, one that works. Let me zoom across here again. See if we can get to the beginning of another segment. Hold on, folks. I should probably educate myself and my tools before we try to do a video, right? So we should be coming up on the beginning of another one. Oops. So right now, 
Hey, that one looks a little even better. We can see more of a profile of that one. So again, you know, solenoids energized, mechanical movement of whatever pinnels in it to allow oil pressure to flow, and then, you know, holds it open for a given period of time, whatever the scan tool is telling it to do. So I'm pretty confident electrically ECM has control. Our solenoid appears to mechanically function. Uh, so at this point, we need to, I don't know what we need to do. We need to look at uh, some code criteria. Perhaps we are dealing with uh, a physically busted lifter, uh, in which case on these, if I remember correctly, you got to pull the heads uh, to do lifters. Awesome. So let's keep moving. So looking through service info, we've done essentially, Chrysler actually has a pretty good flow chart on this, if I would have to agree, which flow charts usually suck, but... Uh, their flow chart is actually pretty good. It has some pretty definitive tests. They actually use a test light, and they have some kind of funny stuff in there. Uh, we won't get into that right now, but uh, needless to say, we've gone down through their steps, uh, essentially, you know, measured resistance. They want to use a test light. Is it getting power to it? I determined that the connector's too hard to get to. Next best thing is an amp clamp because, you know, we wouldn't have amperage. We wouldn't be able to build the one amp through 12 ohms of resistance if we didn't have sufficient power. So that proves a lot right there. Uh, proves, you know, if we could have done that test first, to be honest with you, that proves our resistance is good, power is good, control is good, everything's good. Uh, what they want you to do next, uh, according to uh, service info, is they want you to pull the intake and actually pull the solenoid out to inspect the oil passages. You know, does it have a plugged oil passage? Well, that's I mean, that's kind of prohibitive. Uh, after that, if you determine that the oil passage is good, the solenoid physically moves. What they want you to do is pull the intake, actuate it, and see if you hear it clicking, which we don't have to do because our amperage shows us that it works. Um, they tell you at the end of that, go ahead and replace the lifter assemblies. Uh, how do they state it here? Uh, because no other possible causes remain. So that's where we're at with it. It likely needs lifter assemblies. Can we definitively prove it uh, would be my next move. Uh, I would think knowing uh, from past experience how these lifter assemblies work that they actually physically unlock. It allows, this is probably not gonna be a good representation, but this is my push rod, this is my lifter. When the lifter uh, lock pins come out of it, it actually the lifter will, will go up and around uh, the push rod. Bear with me here, folks. Uh, instead of having oil pressure where, you know, they move as an assembly, it just decouples it. And then, you know, of course the camshaft still actuates, but it, you know, bleeds off the pressure, so to speak. And then, you know, the push rod remains stationary. So we could do one of two things. Uh, we could pull the valve cover, start it up, see if the rocker arms are stationary. Uh, I find it kind of hard to believe that both have failed. Um, or I'm wondering if we can do an in-cylinder pressure test and gather some data from that and see, you know, that cylinder have, you know, low or no compression, you know, what's going on there. I went ahead and removed the coil from number seven cylinder, removed a spark plug, one of the two, which is heavily fouled. I don't know if you guys can see that or not. Reeks like gas, completely black. This is kind of peculiar. Um, our compression waveform appears to be perfect. I can see the function of all the valves. Our piston goes up. Uh, what, 65 PSI running compression, so that's that's pretty normal. Comes down, we see the exhaust valve open pretty much where it should be. It goes back up to zero PSI, that's our lower line there. Um, our exhaust valve closes, intake valve opens, pulls it into a deep vacuum. Uh, minus, what, 10 PSI, so, you know, really good vacuum. And then, you know, stroke, uh, cylinder, you know, starts to go up, you know, intake valve closes, goes up, and the cylinder charges again. And this was after, you can see down here on my zoom in, this is after, let's say, you know, 40 seconds of running. I don't see anything wrong with the valves or the lifters. So I'm going to have to think about this. I'm not sure where to go next. So at this point, I am curious to know if this is some kind of logic based something or other, um, I'm going to go through and do a full ECU reset because it appears that everything functions, at least under at this temperature and this test condition. We're going to reset all the adaptive values in it. Oops. I don't want to 
just reset the adaptive numerator. We'll go all adaptive memory. So it's gonna be similar to disconnecting your battery and you know touching the cables together type thing. So then we're gonna take I should not have any more codes in it. Alright, no codes. I'm gonna take and start it up. to be running dead smooth. Let's see if it re reinstalled or reactivated our injector. Oh, Marie. Marie's hiding in the background. See my face, Marie? Huh? This is my angry face. Stupid cars. Let's grab a Low amp command. That's really gonna burn my biscuits because we wasted a whole lot of time chasing goats. Does the car have a problem? Probably. Does it have a problem currently? No. Get it currently? Anybody get that joke? You get that joke, man? I got it. You got it? Yeah. Da, da, da. They ask me why I drink. Let's see. Get you guys set up here. Whoa, check the USB cable. Sometimes the Pico does not like to be shut off, like, you know, flip the lid shut, open it back up. Get rid of all this mumbo jumbo. Go back on that injector. It sure does sound like it's working. Looks like I've got it going in the right direction too. Imagine that. All right, let's see here. Let's change our time basis. Let's get us a trigger up on the screen. more sense. Must be picking up our secondary ignition there. Yes. Kind of hard to have that in a happy spot. Sitting right next to our ignition coil, but we can see our fuel injector is now being commanded back on. We've done nothing other than verify a perfectly good circuit. Probably, I tell you what, let's uh, sort of stop that from happening. We will put it on the falling edge. Now uh, let's see, advanced edge, simple edge, rising edge, falling edge. There we go. That'll stop from picking up that secondary. No, it won't, because it's still up into the same threshold. So, there. We'll just move our clamp. That's what we should have done in the first place. So. There's our fuel injector. Our clamp just fell over. It does function. I just want to quit and go home. So honestly, I really don't know what to say at this point because now it's running perfectly. We've done nothing. Let's like say we verified the circuit. Does that solenoid work? It does. Does it command it on? It does. Does it physically move? It does. Cleared the codes. It immediately comes back. It always disables the number seven injector as a default strategy to prevent it from, you know, ruining the converter. Doing the in-cylinder test, I really, I guess I shouldn't be surprised by seeing what we saw because when we crank the engine over, it doesn't sound like it has a cylinder with no compression. You know, for example, one that has collapsed lifters or lifters that are being mechanically open. I think the only thing we can do at this point is let the engine warm up take it for a drive, run it through the code setting criteria again, let it activate, deactivate that cylinder. Is that solenoid failing perhaps once it gets hot? But why, how come when I clear the codes, 
it didn't just come back and everybody was happy. I don't know. I don't pretend to know everything. I don't know why it didn't. All I know is doing, you know, reboot. It's like rebooting Windows, doing a hard reset on it. And all of a sudden, everybody's happy. Let me give her a couple rub ups. It's running smooth as a Swiss watch. How smooth they run, I don't know because I don't own one. Uh, I'm slightly frustrated. I'm going to give up for the night. Call it quits. I'm going to go home. I already worked OT. I think we're going to find something sweet, but we didn't. It's obviously some kind of logic. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts in the comment box below. I'm going to drive the vehicle tomorrow, warm it up. I'm going to run it in and out of this multi-displacement cylinder mode several times. Uh, yes, I've checked the oil to make sure the oil level is full and clean and all that, you know, basic stuff. I've seen solenoids break down under heat, so perhaps once it gets hot, it fails. Once it's cycled when it's hot, it fails. I don't know. We're going to have to try to recreate it. If I can't, all I can do is give it back to the customer and move on with my day. That's it. Go down. Click subscribe, ring the bell, do all that stuff. Just remember, viewers, if I can do it, you can do it. Thanks for watching.